you can also benefit from interpreting on channels three and four of your devices. And we shall now start discussing a subject which has been covered more generally yesterday. And uh, we're now going to go into the finer details, um, discuss a number of practices, and try to reflect upon the issue of uh, green conservation uh, of heritage. So for the director of the Institut National du Patrimoine, myself, uh, it's an important issue because it's at the core of uh, our, it has been at the core of our work for the past 10 years. Uh, sustainable development appeared as a concern for us in 2009, and we are trying to organize uh, a number of training sessions year after year to which you're all welcome to attend how and which discuss issues of how can we uh, make people understand that heritage is in itself crucial to sustainable development and the environment and how in practical terms we can found the methods and resources to make sure that any intervention on heritage is as environmentally friendly as possible. So for this panel discussion, uh, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. French time, I have uh, Miriam Ali Awala, who's a postdoc student at uh, the University of Bordeaux, ENSA Bordeaux, and uh, a qualified architect. Anna Magnin, director of the uh, Historical Monument Research Lab. We also have uh, Mrs. Villar, who is an associate professor of geoscience of uh, CY uh, Sergi University of Paris, France, and Mathilde Monachon, who's a postdoc student at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. Without further ado, let us listen to Miriam Ali Awala, who will be telling us about a number of methodological approaches for a more reasonable interventions on historic monuments. The floor is yours for 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you very much. Let me find my slides. So the subject is adapting 20th century architecture to today's environmental challenges. And since the late 90s, 20th century, architecture uh, has garnered more interest, and deservedly so. Although it does not necessarily have monumental and classical architectural forms, it is a monument of uh, the indus industrialization of our society and the new ways of living. 20th century architecture uh, is a statement, a revolutionary statement against the established order with new techniques provided by construction modes and various materials such as concrete, steel, or glass. The creation of the Patrimoine du XXe siècle label and that of Architecture Contemporaine Remarquable identifies the specificities uh, and innovation or architectural uh, buildings or various engineering works uh, uh, of uh, uh, the 20th century as a civilizational heritage and its adaptation to the energy transition. Although technological advances are uh, good at uh, mitigating the absence of comfort, they do not always uh, comply with uh, the needs, uh, the requirements of protection. Uh, our exploration in the uh, Nouvelle Aquitaine region with the uh, ANSAP Bordeaux and the Institute of uh, Mechanics and Engineering of the University, University of Bordeaux worked with uh, uh, businesses in the industry to verify the acceptability and feasibility of the energy renovation of uh, listed buildings. With as a case uh, study, the, uh, double, the uh, ventilated double skin. So either it can be placed under a uh, a bell or protection or, or not. And the purpose of this research was to establish a methodology uh, to inform decision making in the renovation of 20th century architectural uh, uh, buildings and uh, ACRs uh, in terms of energy transition to 
um, encourage a uh, improved reading of architectural and symbolic values. So in terms of methodology, we're trying to put forward the complementarity of prospective and retrospective approaches for an innovative and sustainable intervention. Before I go into the details, let me define what a ventilated double skin is, because it's a tech, very technical term. It's uh, called a bioclimate facade for its energy performance. I might call it DPV, actually, to go and save a bit of time. Uh, thickens the architectural envelope to improve thermal insulation with an essentially passive system. The idea is to create a, an air buffer that creates a kind of greenhouse effect in the winter, uh, thanks to the sun, and a chimney effect uh, in the summer to naturally refresh the environment. Uh, this can take on uh, various architectural forms, uh, both uh, in new build and uh, are added to uh, older build. Uh, you can see here a before-after uh, picture uh, in various buildings, uh, and this one in Switzerland in particular, a very striking difference. Based on that, we started to um, study the feasibility and acceptability of this method. On the one hand, we created a state of the art of uh, uh, outer skin renovation to see what has been done worldwide to identify parameters. This uh, documentary review allows us to investigate programs, environments where this system is applied and to see the contribution in terms of energy contribution and uh, the dialogue with ex existing build. And uh, this breaks down the material characteristics of the building and uh, constitutes a kind of archaeology of the location with details of the envelope and structure and the usages and how it fits into its uh, uh, architectural environment. And then we conduct an architectural analysis of a panel of buildings across Nouvelle-Aquitaine, all 20th century, uh, either vernacular or recognized, identified for their remarkable contemporary architecture to assess the feasibility of such renovation. And thanks to this uh, prospective research, we have tried to identify typomorphologies and architectonics tonics that may house or receive a uh, DPV for technical or cultural reasons. And this uh, ongoing work uh, with feedback from renovations already performed uh, should result in guidelines, contribute to uh, technical uh, research technical studies with a qualitative approach. And then finally, based on a selection of case studies of renovation across Nouvelle-Aquitaine, we're trying to understand the uh, discourse of the stakeholders and the con controversial aspects uh, based on in-depth uh, interviews and monographs. We want to understand what has mobilized by uh, the uh, uh, construction uh, uh, and architecture and so on in implementing DPVs. The uh, motives for the choice of the system, the type of analysis, uh, the dialogue with existing build, and post-delivery feedback. Additional information can come from uh, specialists in the field and the consultant from the DRAC of uh, Nouvelle-Aquitaine. Uh, which allows us to have a, a new look on uh, DPV uh, renovations within overall intervention uh, systems. And interviews in a later phase are also scheduled for with the users of these renovated buildings to see whether the experience of uh, the people who live there is consistent with the original intent. Uh, we'll now examine the renovation, DPV renovation of the Faculty of Sciences of the University of Bordeaux. Uh, this was created by René Coulon in the early 1950s and uh, was built in the 1960s. And according to our historian Franck Delorme, there was a new centrality of the university with rational architecture in the proportions of the facades and organization, linear organization of the buildings around 
a, a green space throughout. The building meant that Coulomb also meant that the uh, envelope work was uh, um, very interesting, with the central motif and symmetry uh, with uh, regular openings which increase uh, and enhance the horizontal lines. And the stairwells uh, have uh, uh, concrete uh, openings that reveal the angles and the austerity of orthogonal lines uh, is softened by the uh, pink uh, colors uh, of uh, the uh, gravel um, pebble-dashed concrete built in the last century uh, they became challenging in terms of uh, uh, the uh, climate uh, or, and uh, in terms of energy consumption. And uh, the organization of the renovation uh, said that uh, the university r truly wished, wished to address the issues of uh, climate change, uh, particularly in terms of energy consumption. Uh, so a call for tender uh, was uh, uh, put out, and Bouygues and Atelier Paul Shemitov were selected. Although DPDV renovation was not initially uh, voiced uh, as uh, a priority, it was the only one uh, to offer a uh, six-fold lower uh, uh, energy consumption while respecting uh, the existing architecture. And this transparent DPV was augmented uh, by a system that makes it into true thermal machinery. And uh, just uh, outdoor cladding would have uh, completely erased the existing buildings. And DP, the choice of DPV was unanimous beyond the objective of protection and a promise of performance, it could be done uh, while the building was still occupied, which mitigated the cost. And uh, there were, of course, a great number of challenges, both due to the nature of the buildings, their fragility, and the logistics on site. Uh, according to uh, the construction managers, it modernized the campus, but did not quite deliver in terms of performance. The technology was not sufficiently tested in uh, renovations. Uh, many uh, technical failures uh, meant that it was not very much better than cladding. But it was, however, the most adequate because it was a compromise between uh, uh, climate and, uh, and heritage. As a specialist of remarkable uh, contemporary architecture. The consultant for DRAC was uh, uh, had a much more mitigated opinion and said that uh, there was an effacement of that. And DPV changed the nature of the building and was much more technical than architectural in itself. However, DPV uh, is uh, uh, one of the benefits of DPV is that it's reversible. And uh, the existing architecture cannot suffer from the obsolescence of the system or even uh, a, a future uh, listing. So uh, current research seeks to reveal the qualitative appreciation of uh, 20th century and remarkable contemporary architecture, which should come with the technical solutions uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency improvement. And the controversial renovation focuses both on the uh, uh, desire to preserve the heritage and the ambition in energy transition. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation and for uh, giving us these uh, examples of the uh, confrontation uh, we can see that, uh, of course, there are varying opinions on the use of such methods. Now, I shall yield the floor to Lynn Magna, director of the ADRMH, uh, the research lab for historical monuments, who is going to be telling us about the restoration and preservation of ancient materials. And uh, 
allow us to understand how heritage is at the heart of sustainable development and environmental issues. Yes, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, many thanks to the organizers for accepting uh, my uh, uh, presentation proposal. Okay, so I control this. So the present, my presentation is drawn from our lab's general work. LRMH, you may not all be familiar with it. I think probably most of you in the room are familiar with it, um, but not necessarily everyone is. We are a national department uh, under the Direction Générale des Patrimoines dedicated to research on conservation and restoration. Our lab essentially provides help to those who are in charge of uh, restoration, uh, both uh, uh, objects and buildings. And in parallel, uh, in parallel of what we call our service activity, we also conduct research to improve conservation techniques which are changing very fast, not only with the scientific progress and improved knowledge, but also with reflections underway in society at large. There is a more or less a great degree of tolerance to various practices. And I think conservation and restoration techniques for buildings and objects have changed very much over time with society itself. Restoration and conservation, it was said, yesterday is in itself an environmentally friendly practice because the fact that one preserves and repairs and uh, extends the lifespan is in itself uh, something that can be categorized as being environmental. And it's true that uh, society is becoming much more aware of this, upcycling, repair cafes, vintage and so on is becoming increasingly popular in many fields and shows that the great period of wastefulness of disposable things, uh, which um, socially uh, was relatively recent, may be on the way out. And that we're returning to more traditional practices of conserving, recycling, repairing, reusing. So the laboratory and its uh, uh, preservation uh, techniques are attached to the preservation of the original material as the main marker of uh, authenticity. And restoration of historic monuments tries to preserve these as much as possible uh, through consolidation and treatments uh, by the use of products which, for instance, can uh, attack biocides, microorganisms, uh, um, uh, algae, uh, uh, fungus and so on, which may uh, attack all sorts of materials. You can see here microbiological attacks on uh, uh, on uh, uh, on heritage, and some of these natural elements are also, in a sense, human co-productions because nitrates are uh, uh, very much involved in uh, the algae. The uh, black crust does come from uh, in, uh, from air pollution, and so it's not just natural, it's also human-made. And very often these microbiological treatments are chemical, and of course uh, these are less acceptable and very often are actually prohibited by European uh, regulation. The European Chemicals Agency, uh, with a REACH directive, uh, creates new rules and encourages people to find substitute products. Therefore, research in this field has tried to find treatments, uh, alternative treatments, uh, a couple of them. Uh, the, for example, uh, the development of UVCs, which are ultraviolet uh, lights that destroy, um, in a very efficient way, uh, both the green algae in uh, buildings, in historic buildings, or in uh, uh, decorated caves, where a chemical intervention is very often uh, extremely restricted. And uh, 
and suspicious in a sense and uh, under attack or rather suspected of uh, deteriorating and modifying the cave's climate balance and atmospheric balance without and so that is extremely unpopular at the moment. So UVC treatment without any use of chemicals makes it possible to remove a number of alterations. So here the picture doesn't really show it very clearly, but there are uh, green here alterations, an early infestation which after treatment disappears. There are other uh, resources which may also be chemical, but uh, for instance, uh, essential oils. So, of course, they are chemicals in a sense, but at least uh, natural chemicals, or at least considered so. And uh, according to tests developed through and with a private restoration company, that uh, a number of essential oils, uh, well, this is very patent, it's patented, so I can't be uh, very precise in discussing that, actually allow the eradication or considerable reduction um, uh, as well as conventional and chemical treatments uh, to reduce infestations um, in uh, here you see the Strasbourg Cathedral, the steps. You have a uh, uh, schematic representation where you can see that treatment with essential oils is effective. Uh, more pictures to show you that. And then uh, we are also implementing and testing in the lab currently a quarantine chamber. It's a, a drying processing of uh, paper documents here, uh, books, manuscripts, uh, bundles of archive material that were deteriorated by infestations, by microbiological infestation. And that requires absolutely no use of chemicals whatsoever. It's purely drying. And we also used gamma rays, which may um, sound dangerous or hazardous. Uh, of course, in, uh, in high doses, they can be. But in lower doses, they can uh, disinfect archive material uh, very efficiently. And finally, the use of porous polymer uh, display cases, we talked about porous materials yesterday, to rebalance a number of uh, display cases here. This is to uh, fight against excess humidity and preserve in these displays a number of items. Uh, this is uh, a uh, relic uh, holder in Saint-Capré, a kind of shrine where these membrane uh, display cases avoid the use of materials used beforehand to pump out humidity, were requiring uh, the, uh, the buckets of water be emptied on a regular basis, and that also involved the use of chemicals. And here, uh, the use of these membrane uh, display cases makes it possible to effectively counter uh, excess humidity. And the process has been used in France. It's currently being installed in Chartres in the uh, new uh, treasure. Uh, it's uh, an electrolytic system. And we're working with the Museum uh, of the Quai Branly, which has also been working with the Daomey Museum, uh, which has a very high uh, humidity and which is uh, greatly interested in the development of such types of display cases. Uh, France Museum also interrogated us to know whether in, in highly dry climates uh, the uh, movement could be reversed. Uh, that is still at the project stage because we've been unable to test that. So techniques that are material techniques, preventive uh, conservation for the preservation of stained glass windows, for instance, to avoid or prevent 
two minutes? Oh dear. I had better get a move on then. So biomineralization. So my presentation was essentially dedicated to the articulation between nature and culture. So biomineralization. It's a manner in which nature can be used against its own interests, in a sense, to reuse bacteria, to recreate stone in uh, altered buildings. Uh, this is uh, an experiment of biological mortar. And there are also a number of research projects dedicated to ancient materials uh, that can come when we locally sourced, such as plaster. We recently discovered in the Marais uh, an original uh, plaster covering uh, dating from 1675, which shows that plaster can um, be a, a, a very long-lasting material. Earthenware. Uh, uh, ANR is an ANR is uh, underway. Uh, uh, here, it's a project conducted uh, with Paris. And then, if we look at concrete, a number of projects uh, also help to improve durability. Uh, a program with Getty in Historic England on the repair of concrete. And I would just finish with. Uh, the issue of uh, of greened uh, spaces here. This is the chateau in Coucy in 1891, where uh, the ruins were covered in grass. Other techniques were then used, particularly cement mortars on the uh, rampart walls. But it's not a very satisfactory solution. You can see here the black algae. So after what is known as soft capping developed in England, but also in Italy uh, since the early 20th century, uh, it has been considered that uh, these uh, walls could be covered by uh, select uh, vegetal species to avoid destruction. So the question emerges of uh, the relationship between uh, vegetation and architecture. This is the Abbey at Beauport uh, with a vegetal uh, covering uh, that is maintained. Uh, one could also uh, talk about uh, La Folie Si Fair, which is a folly. There's a complex relationship, but unfortunately, no time to go into the details. Another question that emerges is how tolerant can we be of, uh, in terms of the relationship between vegetation and historic monuments? This is the Ronchamp Chapel. Uh, the fountain right next to the chapel, which is starting to be infested by uh, uh, by algae, uh, quite simply. How tolerant are we? What is acceptable as a link between architecture and vegetation um, in with the uh, uh, biodiversity associated with it? And what is the uh, pact? Um, perhaps we could we should reverse the way we consider things. We tend to believe that to preserve the culture, you need to fight the natural. But perhaps uh, nature could be better integrated uh, to uh, the build. I'm sorry, I was perhaps a little bit long. Well, thank you very much. A, a wonderful conclusion in any case. A wonderful conclusion you're offering us after this uh, overview, both of, uh, uh, of intervention techniques, the different materials, uh, the new possible uses. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this uh, very broad sweeping view of the issue. Now we shall be listening uh, remotely to Mrs. Beatrice Menendez Villar. Can we see her? So no sound, unfortunately, says the interpreter. Mrs. Menendez Villa is a lecturer at the Geosciences and Environment Department of Sergi Paris University in France. And she will be talking about the SCORE project, uh, Sustainable Conservation and Restoration, a SCORE of Built Cultural Heritage. Can uh, we hear Madame Menendez-Villard? 
She's online. We cannot uh, hear her, unfortunately. So uh, we're waiting for the uh, for the sound to come through. No sound yet from uh, Madame Menendez Villar. So the project, the score projects. I'm going to be uh, introducing the objectives and highlights. Uh, so the objectives are two types of objectives, uh, uh, once uh, of uh, research and innovation objectives uh, and also specific objectives uh, for the uh, project uh, score. In research and innovation objectives, uh, one of them is the development of green innovations for materials and methods for the conservation of ancient buildings in the context uh, of a circular economy philosophy. It's also uh, looking to uh, observe the uh, interaction between uh, materials and the environment. That is to say we're going to propose materials and innovative uh, methods uh, which are going to be respectful of the environment and which are going to minimize uh, the impact that it can have on the environment. And on the other hand, we're also going to be looking at uh, what uh, what uh, impact the environment has on these methods and materials. So the third objective is a transfer to society uh, through through uh, numerous means, uh, lessons, uh, uh, university courses, uh, trainings dedicated uh, for this uh, for either professionals or private individuals, and also with uh, knowledge transfer towards uh, the society. Uh, uh, not just the scientific, uh, the scientific uh, sector, but also professional sector. So the specific objectives was to develop uh, international, interdisciplinary, and also uh, cross-industry, cross-sector partnerships. Also uh, to have uh, uh, research and innovation staff exchange. And uh, finally, uh, the objective three is to share knowledge and ideas from research uh, into uh, heritage. So what are the main points, the highlights uh, we are going to uh we have, uh, for one year now, we have started, but because of the pandemic, it's all been uh, done remotely, of course. It's been quite uh, complex. Uh, we're going to be looking at two types of uh, heritage, uh, uh, vernacular built cultural heritage in Europe and also archaeological sites in Latin America, uh, in Mexico. Uh, uh, why this two type of heritage, uh, of uh, built cultural heritage? Because we considered that the vernacular built cultural heritage uh, is uh, much less protected than uh, the heritage of uh, monuments, historical monuments. So it needs to be uh, uh, focused on, looked at, and uh, the archaeological sites, because Mexico has uh, over 25,000 pre-Hispanic uh, archaeological sites. Uh, the problem is a pure quantity. Uh, it's it makes it difficult to protect these sites. We also chose these two uh, sites for climate reasons, uh, because they're very, they are uh, uh, extremely different uh, equatorial climate uh, in Latin America and warmer temperate in Europe. And in addition to having uh, different climates, uh, the future evolution will also be different uh, between these two climates. So, so the, highlights, uh, the highlights, as we said, uh, it's an intersectoral, international and multidisciplinary uh, group uh, is the SCORE project. So we have uh, material scientists, uh, biologists, uh, civil engineering researchers, climatologists. We also have art historians, archaeologists. We have life cycle assessment specialists. Uh, and in addition to that, we have practitioners, consulting companies, uh, training organizations, decision makers, uh, NGOs. Uh, we're also looking to develop a series of uh, innovative materials and methods. And also, we're going to we'll be looking at uh, at the uh, econom at the uh, cultural constraints of these buildings uh, uh, we also take into account the ecological economic and social aspects uh, because uh, the uh, vernacular uh, heritage uh, is really closely linked to society, of course. So who are the partners and the sites that we're going to be uh, looking at, working with? I won't go into detail. You can see uh, here, you can see there's uh, universities involved in France, uh, CY Sergi Paris, notably. There's also uh, uh, 
universities in Italy, research centers in Italy also, uh, Copenhagen University uh, in Denmark, uh, research center in Madrid, also uh, a company in Spain. Uh, Rampart, uh, which are uh, NGOs uh, in France uh, and in America. We have a uh, university in Colombia uh, in the Americas and universities and centers of research in Mexico and also the uh, natural, uh, National Archaeology History Institute uh, of Merida, which uh, works on the valorization of all the archaeological sites in uh, Mexico, so there are different sectors represented, uh, different sectors, uh, uh, earth sciences, uh, chemistry, uh, climatologists uh, also. So as I said, there's a wide panel, a wide array of different competencies. Uh, so with regard to the sites now, there are sites uh, in France, uh, in Mexico, uh, so uh, in, in Europe, uh, beyond France even, uh, in Europe, uh, we'll go into the breakdown. And uh, in Mexico, it's in uh, the uh, Yucatan Peninsula, that is to say, with climate which are quite similar, but sites which uh, differ quite a lot, uh, one from the other. So uh, in uh, France, uh, you see that they're away from Paris uh, uh, with uh, big uh, pressure, uh, with the uh, developments of, uh, of dwelling areas, but which is controlled uh, in Madrid. It's the whole of the community of Madrid, uh, so the center of Spain, uh, therefore. Uh, and uh, the bigger, the greater Madrid, there are areas uh, which are uh, quite uh, deserted. And uh, the interpreter says, we have lost uh, the lady again. So no sound coming through from the uh, interpreter side. We're waiting. I have no doubt we will be reconnected shortly to Mrs. Benendis Villa. We seem to have uh, lost Mrs. Menendez Villar for the moment. But she'll be back, we have no doubt. Est-ce que vous m'entendez, Beatrice? So no doubt uh, we'll be reconnecting shortly. Je ne sais pas si les personnes en ligne peuvent continuer. I don't know whether people following online can follow the communication, but we can't hear in the room, says the presenter. Oui, c'est ça, je pense qu'elle continue. Oui, j'ai l'impression que la personne ne sait pas qu'on ne l'entend pas. I believe that uh, the lady does not know that we cannot hear her. She seems to be continuing her presentation. Mrs. Menendez Villar, she has three minutes to go at any rate. Il n'y a pas d'arrêt de jeu, non. La fédération est très claire. Combien de secondes Ah, je ne suis pas à ce niveau de... On ne l'entend pas en ligne non plus. Bon. So she can't be heard uh, online either. So 
nobody can hear her, unfortunately. Oui, peut-être peut-on envoyer un message sur le chat à. C'est ça, Madame Menendez Villard Ils vont, on, a, on va faire une analyse des cycles de vie pour voir les impacts. So uh, we're going to look at uh, the impacts on the environment. Uh, so uh, once uh, we've uh, done that, uh, it goes back to uh, where it was. Uh, we're looking at the case study here. So we're explaining now that uh, we lost you for three or four minutes. Should I start with this slide? Yes, please uh, start with this slide, uh, Madame, and we'll follow you for two, three minutes more. So, thank you. So, uh, the method, the working method, uh, is summarized on this slide uh, here. Uh, in this case study, uh, so we look at uh, the documentation available uh, for the building or the sites that we're looking to study to know uh, what its history is, uh, how it was built, uh, what the methods used were. We also uh, study the uh, original materials uh, and their characterization. Yes, we're still, you're breaking up, uh, you're breaking up. Uh, I'm afraid. I'll continue. Nevertheless, I'll try because uh, it was functioning yesterday. Uh, so we we uh, offer new methods and techniques. Uh, we suggest them, uh, which are going to be uh, tested for their sustainability. We have durability tests. Uh, they are signed off, uh, they are agreed upon. Um, once uh, they have been uh, accepted, uh, we continue and we assess the life cycle. Uh, once uh, the uh, stage is uh, passed, we are then going to look at uh, how these materials behave, how these methods behave. Uh, in, uh, and how they will behave. We, uh, we have projections uh, on uh, climate modeling, uh, which enables us to assess uh, the impact uh, that uh, the weather and the climate and environment will have on these methods, uh, on uh, these uh, materials. So with that climate modeling, uh, it enables us uh, to uh, predict behaviors. Uh, and if they're not adapted to the climate, uh, to what we uh, forecast, uh, um, then we go back to the design. Uh, and uh, once all those filters have gone through uh, successfully, we go to the validation, which is done uh, by uh, the uh, stakeholders who intervene at this stage, the validation. If the methods are validated uh, in this final stage, uh, uh, WP3, uh, then we go into the case study. Uh, Thank you very much. I'll ask you maybe to conclude rapidly, madam. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, simply uh, the expected uh, results uh, for us, uh, it's uh, to uh, produce uh, uh, restoration and rehabilitation methods and products which are green, uh, to research contributions, and also a transfer of knowledge to society and uh, the development of uh, uh, internationally. So that is the current work uh, which is being done currently in Mexico. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, and uh, apologies for uh, these uh, mishaps uh, and uh, the technical issues encountered, but we'll have understood uh, the uh, whole uh, cycle uh, of your project uh, and its uh, applications, its concrete applications at once uh, in sites uh, in Mexico and in Europe. Uh, thank you. Now we're going to hear Mathilde Monachon, also online. I hope that we'll have a, a better, a better connection, uh, who's a postdoctoral researcher at Neuchâtel University in Switzerland, uh, and who is going to be talking about the project Get On Board with regard to uh, the bio-extraction of uh, harmful, uh, harmful products uh, uh, which are present uh, in uh, archaeological woods. Uh, yes, hello. 
Hello. So uh, you have uh, 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. So the presentation is loading, and you'll be uh, you'll be on shortly. Here we go. So hello, hello, and uh, thank you for having invited me to this roundtable. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the Get On Board uh, project uh, for the uh, conservation of archaeological uh, woods with a bacterian extraction system, as you uh, mentioned. Uh, so a quick introduction now to explain the context. Uh, so we work uh, with uh, archaeological wood, which is uh, waterlogged, uh, which is recuperated in uh, uh, environments with a low oxygen level, uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, wood is attacked by bacteria, not by uh, fungus. Uh, uh, or, or, so we have this uh, image here. Uh, you have uh, uh, you have uh, um, iron sulfide in this uh, wood, which is uh, damaged uh, with uh, uh, in the anaerobic uh, environment. So there are issues. Uh, uh, once uh, once the uh, wood uh, would, uh, uh, is uh, removed uh, from uh, the water, for instance, where they have uh, more oxygen, higher oxygen levels, uh, uh, and then we note uh, oxidation uh, uh, of the uh, iron the sulfide, uh, uh, and uh, it can become a sulfur, a sulfuric uh, acid, uh, which is going to damage the wood. Uh, uh, so the idea is to avoid uh, this, uh, that uh, it be damaged. Uh, and for that, uh, the project uh, Get On Board uh, has a preventive approach. That is to say that before we remove the objects uh, from uh, the water, uh, from the water environment, a biological method, uh, because uh, these are bacteria which have uh, enabled uh, the, uh, pr the uh, formation of the iron Sulfide. So we uh, thought it would be possible to use bacteria to uh, to uh, extract uh, that iron sulfide. So you have the uh, wood here with uh, with uh, iron sulfide, and we'll uh, put them in contact with bacteria, which is going to conform con uh, to uh, put them into uh, iron two or sulfides. Uh, so uh, that can be uh, removed uh, easier from the objects. Uh, sometimes the iron might reprecipitate uh, or may or is not attached uh, to a uh, sulfide. And so the idea would be to use a uh, 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 natural, uh, natural approach. Uh and uh, there we would put our samples of wood. Uh, we would uh, present them uh, with the, these uh, uh, methods to convert to the, the uh, iron into a more soluble form. So we have already started uh, these exper experiments. Uh, uh, the project to get on board is also a multidisciplinary uh, project, uh, which brings together microbiologists uh, who are going to work on the development of this uh, bioextraction method, what bacteria we're going to use. Uh, what uh, needs to be uh, put in place to have a green approach also because uh, the microorganisms that we uh, propose, uh, they not, must not be harmful to the health uh, of the user or indeed of the wood. Uh, and uh, the uh, chemical, uh, the chemical side for the analytical method is to analyze the method of bioextraction, uh, comparing it to the existing uh, chemical uh, approach. But there's also be a conservation uh, approach with uh, wood conservers uh, who uh, who have uh, wooden objects uh, and uh, they uh, have uh, objects that they would like to uh, to be uh, to be uh, treated uh, and processed uh, to see if the methods are feasible, accessible, and in line with their expectations and needs, uh, say, to assess this method. So what we have uh, suggested is to do a control by uh, keeping uh, the wood uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, filtered water, distilled water, uh, biological extraction, uh, and also in parallel of that, a chemical extraction uh, with an oxidation of the sulfur and a complexation of uh, the iron to assess our method. Uh, we're going to uh, look at, first and foremost, uh, the appearance of the wood after the process processing after the treatment, if there's a big difference between the state it was in before and after, if there's a risk for the wood, if there's any uh, damaging and degradation. 
of uh, the wood. And of course, if we've managed to uh, extract uh, the uh, the uh, sulfide from the wood, uh, uh, either with a Raman uh, analysis or an ICP OES uh, analysis, and finally, the way there's going to be uh, discussions of validation with the conservators, the conservators. The first one is going to be the stability of uh, the uh, treated objects, uh, and uh, after that, consolidation, uh, and over the long term, uh, what uh, what the appearance of said objects is. Uh, So here I am presenting uh, the results uh, uh, with uh, pine and oak because uh, those are the uh, what are the conservators uh, who work with us uh, on the projects had in reserve and that they were presented uh, the issues with regard uh, to uh, iron sulfide. So we uh, we tra- treated them and you can see the ones which are non-treated, uh, uh, biologically treated and chemically uh, treated uh, and. Uh, you can see the appearance here, which is a stabilized uh, with uh, uh, the uh, oak, uh, and uh, you can see with the pine. Uh, sorry, the speaker's breaking up a bit. Uh, and uh, there are analysis uh, carried out uh, to measure. We have measured the uh, the uh, intensity uh, to have a ratio here, a baseline. We saw that the ratio was constant, so there was no damage uh, damage that occurred with the uh, organic approach uh, and application, and uh, no uh, worsening uh, either with regard to uh, the content. Uh, uh, and we can see that with an organic uh, treatment, as opposed to, uh, to a chemical one, we maintained the pH was um, uh, close to neutral, uh, um, which is not over the long term going to damage uh, the, uh, the components of the wood itself. Uh, whereas with the chemical treatment, uh, it was more, uh, there was a more acidic uh, for the holocellulose. Uh, and uh, we see that there are different components. Uh, what we noted uh, with the uh, Ramin analysis uh, or with the CP ones, uh, MWC, uh, that after the biological, the organic treatment, uh, there was the oxidization which, was, which had uh, occurred of the iron sulfide, which was no longer on uh, the uh, wood, and a rate of extraction which was uh, higher. Uh, and more promising uh, than what occurs with the chemical treatments. So we, the use of, of bacteria, of bacteriology for uh, preserving and conserving wood was very promising, we noted, uh, for uh, cleaning and uh, preserving and conserving uh, the archaeological uh, uh, waterlogged wood. So then we went on to the conversations uh, uh, with uh, the conservators, uh, the conservers, uh, and um, uh, and they said uh, it was uh, very promising what they said uh, that they have no noted no no there's no shrinking uh, during uh, the uh, the uh, way in which uh, uh, the the uh, samples were uh, processed uh, and uh, treated uh, that uh, the uh, wood was not uh, damaged uh, it was non aggressive for the wood and the final appearance was in line with their expectations uh, with regard uh, to uh, the objectives uh, set out at the outset of the project. So that was a preliminary uh, state. And uh, we were pleased uh, with the result. Uh, uh, and uh, the idea is now to assess how to, how we can apply this organic method, which is uh, currently uh, carried out in uh, research labs. In uh, in real life, in inverted commas, uh, how can we ensure that the bi- uh, bacteria or the microorganisms uh, that we're uh, uh, proposing for the extraction of iron sulfide, uh, how can that uh, be uh, done with the actual equipments? Uh, which equipments are required for the treatment of the uh, of the objects uh, uh, with regard to cost, uh, to time? Uh, uh, how does that compare with the current uh, me- there's, uh, the chemical methods? Uh, uh, and uh, we need to adapt to that. We uh, we looked at uh, the impact of this method uh, uh, 
with, on a number, a number of uh, projects, uh, uh, working with uh, the curators and to see whether the microorganisms uh, are present in the wood with regard to what we apply, whether there's going to, uh, whether that's going to be uh, have effect on uh, other th uh, other points than on the iron sulphide uh, uh, and uh, the uh, the sulphur are not going to damage the wood uh, and uh, uh, do do we just use it? Also, the final point: do we just use it? Uh, in uh, seawater, or is it can be all type of waterlogged uh, archaeological uh, wood, uh, or can we uh, widen widen the approach uh, to uh, other types of uh, archaeological wood, which is uh, waterlogged? Uh, And, uh, and also not just uh, pine and oak, but uh, other types, uh, other types of uh, wood. So we, the idea is to make uh, the method, such a method, uh, more universal and more attractive. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this presentation, which was uh, uh, absolutely uh, interesting uh, on a research point, uh, and uh, we all really uh, can see how that can apply to uh, to uh, practice. Uh, uh, so when you see when you we in. We, we, we restorer is a word that we'd use in French, a restore of the heritage for the good understanding of everybody uh, uh, with regard to what you explained. Uh, uh, so thank you to this, uh, the four speakers uh, for these uh, four uh, communications, which are absolutely important, interesting, uh, and which uh, took us uh, from uh, the uh, Bordeaux architecture of the 20th century into uh, the uh, to, uh, to uh, wood uh, from old galleons uh, and uh, going through the questions of materials, a crucial question, of course, an essential one, and through this uh, presentation, which is uh, unfortunately uh, where we lost a bit uh, uh, with regard to uh, because of the connection of uh, Mrs. Menendez Villar on a project, a specific project, and especially the methodology of this project. Are there for our speakers any questions coming in uh, either from here in the auditorium? Uh, so none on the chat line. I'm told none online for the moment, but maybe here in the venue itself. Yes, uh, Madame valou -Froissart. Uh, Who is off? It's not so much a question, uh, it's more a comment, a general comment with regard to the questions of uh, green conservation and uh, with a sentence that uh, Ali Manier said before with regard to the acceptability levels uh, of organic, uh, of a mineral uh, and, the, and nature with regard uh, and uh, uh, monuments uh, and uh, culture and heritage. I don't think we can say from my point of view that it's a question of acceptance by the general public uh, or by uh, uh, the people in charge uh, of, uh, of uh, heritage. It's a question of impact uh, also, of course, an impact uh, which is reasonable on a building. Uh, of course, we can accept, uh, indeed, uh, naturally, uh, that uh, some lichens be do, could develop and grow uh, or some other types of uh, biological uh, 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 points. Uh, but if we talk about uh, uh, the the question uh, of uh, the uh, the what's uh, what's happening on the uh, Tapron building where there's a destruction which uh, is occurred. Uh, so uh, a geologist once told me I remember where I was talking about the questions of conservation at a level which was maybe more philosophical, uh, and he was saying to me, you know, at any rate, a monument uh, will one day will become uh, uh, will become uh, dust again. And I said, well, maybe, but as late as possible, hopefully. And if we don't do anything, indeed, and if we say that the best way of being green and of uh, respecting, in fact, uh, in effect, environment is to do nothing. Well, uh, maybe, of course, our monuments uh, will turn to dust. Uh, uh, so it's always a question of um, the approach uh, and, uh, and of attention. The idea is to establish a good uh, methodology of assessment of the risk of a factor and of the benefits. Uh, Yes, well, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, in 10 minutes, uh, it's not easy to uh, to uh, deal with such a complex question, naturally, because it goes without saying that, uh, uh, and uh, clearly, you know, I, I, just, I had something uh, too long, and I had to uh, cut into uh, 
I had to cut into uh, what I really wanted to express uh, had I had uh, longer. But of course, there's no uh, question of transforming our cathedrals, our churches, our monuments uh, to forests and just to let, leave them uh, to uh, wither away. But uh, the question, of course, is to think and look at, uh, maybe to reverse to a certain extent, uh, at least uh, on an intellectual uh, plane, uh, maybe not in practice, uh, such as uh, we are going to be doing, but uh, uh, to ask ourselves a question of reversing our reasoning, uh, which is that we you have to destroy and uh, fight against uh, nature absolutely at any cost uh, in order to uh, preserve and uh, conserve monuments. Uh, but uh, maybe there is a well, I talked about the question of lichens uh, and some uh, mosses, because when you uh, eradicate, uh, when you remove uh, those natural uh, elements, uh, uh, young people who come to recanalize uh, Uh, the the genes that we uh, have become much more stronger, much stronger. Uh, so it's a question of uh, dosing, uh, uh, of uh, thinking, of looking, of analyzing. It's made to with regard to maintenance, the policy of maintenance, the current policy. You know this as well as I do. With regard to monuments, uh, is not to uh, is to uh, really focus on maintenance. It's a question of budget, of general policy, of costs. Uh, And uh, therefore, a number. Well, it's a whole, uh, a whole uh, uh, array of questions. And in 10 minutes, I didn't have the uh, the time to to sum to uh, synthesize to summarize everything. Uh, But the question of the uh, acceptability levels uh, of uh, tolerance levels, I was in Visley not long ago where we uh, cleaned uh, uh, the, uh, the the frontage, the facade, and uh, the inhabitants were saying, well, why are you cleaning this? It was so beautiful with these golden lichen, uh, uh, these mosses. It was so beautiful. Why does everything has to become completely white again? Uh, it's not as beautiful. And people couldn't understand. Uh, uh, the, the people who were cleaning uh, thought, no, this is we're doing the right thing here. We're cleaning uh, the monument. Uh, and uh, it made Made me think, uh, to, if you will, of uh, the discussions that we had with the Chinese uh, peers who presented to us a case of uh, two lions. Uh, well, it was very striking this because uh, uh, two lions on a site, I think it was in Kemying, not far from uh, Shan, uh, and they cleaned one, one of these uh, lions. There was lichen, there was uh, moss on, uh, growing on it, and the other one had uh, not yet uh, been It had not it had been uh, cleaned, and there was a whole uh, uh, cold discussion. They had to go on, uh, on national television to uh, explain themselves, and they were told, uh, "Look, you just you destroyed uh, the the moss, uh, the lichens. That's what makes uh, the building uh, authentic. Uh, that's what its heritage it is, and it participates in uh, biodiversity. Also, so maybe we need to look at and think about once more. It, it's not the idea of saying, no, let's just let let everything uh, uh, go.'" Of course, uh, we, we, you know, we're not uh, removing the, uh, the the fromager, to my knowledge. That's also part of. Uh, that's part of the site, also uh, the manufacturing of uh, cheeses, uh, and I couldn't go into the detail with the fully cifé because uh, there's also uh, extremely high involvement uh, and uh, the question of, uh, of the stone of, uh, the, of the, uh, the green. Maybe we can take uh, some other questions. Thank you very much. So Vincent Detel. Yep. So you you presented the action of uh, essential oils, uh, the efficiency of which is known. Uh, but I had a question about the uh, time it took for these products to act and the remnants. Are these things that you've uh, assessed already as part of your tests? You know, because it's an approach that's uh, that's, uh, I'd say, completely in the kind of green trend uh, and therefore quite interesting. And also, um, uh, these are products that are easy to procure uh, rather than uh, rather strange wavelengths uh, that are biologically harmful. Well, it's still work in progress in the long term, uh, the long term evaluation is still underway because it's a it's a very recent technique. Um, so it's actually no longer in the test phase because it has been actually implemented, but it's not being used extensively. Um, but it is truly interesting because uh, 
its uh, effective uh, rather rapidly. And we have not observed any particular remnants. So it is a pathway that we are treading because there are, of course, various types of essential oils from various products. And it's still uh, currently being explored. But it's uh, reasonably satisfactory. Thank you very much. And again, many thanks on behalf of uh, the audience to our four speakers. Uh, many thanks to the audience for attending, either um, here or online. And uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Back to the studios.